early excavations searching for the tomb of Gilgamesh near the Euphrates River. Discussions and rumors surrounding the signs of the end times are becoming increasingly heated because events that have taken place recently make people afraid because they coincide with what is prophesied in the Bible. One of the typical examples that proves this truth is the Euphrates River. It is so scary that former President Donald Trump also had to speak out and give warnings to believers. So are you prepared to hear the shocking reality? What if we told you that a startling discovery was made at the same time as one of the most historic rivers in the world vanished? A legendary ancient giant has been discovered nearby, and an ancient river that had been flowing for thousands of years has abruptly dried up. Join us as we explore the surprising discovery of Mesopotamian mythology's Gilgamesh and the perplexing disappearance of the Euphrates River. Which mysteries are going to be solved? Let's get started because you won't regret missing this one. In the years that followed, George Smith's seminal work interpreting the Gilgamesh epic, questions concerning the historical existence of this legendary king were rife in the academic and archaeological communities. The next logical step was to search for tangible proof that would support or refute Gilgamesh's historical existence. And what better way to start this quest than by looking for his tomb? The text itself states that Gilgamesh was buried in a location near the Euphrates River in the city of Uruk, which is also significant biblically. The city of Uruk holds a significant position not just in Mesopotamian history, but also in the Bible. Situated close to the Euphrates River, this ancient city is one of the oldest known human settlements. The Euphrates River is not only one of the great rivers of ancient Mesopotamia, but also holds a significant place in the scriptures, especially in the book of Genesis, where it is one of the four rivers flowing out of Eden. Thus, the geographical proximity of Uruk to the Euphrates isn't just a matter of Mesopotamian history, but has potential theological implications, providing a tangible link between the Bible and the wider ancient Near Eastern world. Archaeological missions started focusing on Mesopotamian sites in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to find hints that would provide insights into the past. Numerous groups meticulously combed through the layers of history at Uruk's ruins, looking for hints of the colossal tomb of the mythical king. Even though archaeology was still a young science these days, the techniques used were becoming more systematic and guided by a framework that would later come to define contemporary archaeological practice. The journey to find Gilgamesh's tomb was difficult. Because people had lived in Uruk for thousands of years, there were many layers of human history layered on top of one another. Finding the layer that might match Gilgamesh's era was an enormous undertaking in and of itself. Additionally, excavators had to deal with the challenge of telling myth from history. Would they discover a tomb that lived up to the epic's opulent descriptions, or would it be more modest, fitting the remains of a real person rather than a myth? However, several promising artifacts and architectural remains were found during these early excavations. Though none could be definitively linked to Gilgamesh, they provided tantalizing hints. Objects that bore royal inscriptions, monumental walls and buildings suggestive of great wealth and power, and burial sites with remarkable artifacts, all these made the possibility of finding Gilgamesh's tomb seem ever more likely. Conservative Bible archaeologists must proceed with caution when interpreting these findings. The existence of a city such as Uruk, coupled with its proximity to the Euphrates River, presents intriguing opportunities for drawing parallels between different cultures and religions. But this has to be done with due respect for the authority and singularity you know, it's of First Scripture. Presbyterian Church, Jamaica. The Bible makes several mentions of regions and cities that are geographically close to Uruk and the Euphrates. For instance, Babylon, another city by the river, 
plays a major role in biblical history. Understanding the geography, culture, and historical context of these cities could potentially offer new insights into the biblical narrative. Moreover, it's not entirely inconceivable that the Hebrew scribes could have been aware of the Gilgamesh epic, given the trade and diplomatic relations among ancient Near Eastern nations. And suppose the tomb is found. It would be a remarkable find if Gilgamesh's tomb was located and proved to be as magnificent as depicted in the epic. More than that, though, it would raise an important question for academics and theologians alike. How do you balance the biblical stories with the possibility that a historical Gilgamesh was an exceptionally large person? Although it wouldn't support or refute the Bible's authority, it would undoubtedly deepen our understanding of the setting in which the biblical events took place. So we can say that searching for the tomb of Gilgamesh near the Euphrates River have not only furthered our understanding of ancient Mesopotamia, but have also provided a significant context for biblical studies. The mere act of searching for this tomb in the vicinity of the Euphrates offers a compelling blend of historical curiosity and theological inquiry. While the tomb remains elusive, the pursuit itself, marked by both challenges and breakthroughs, serves to deepen our understanding of the complex tapestry of human history, of which the Bible is a central part. Future excavations may yet yield the prize that has tantalized scholars for decades, and if and when that happens, it will undoubtedly open up new dialogues between the fields of archaeology and biblical studies. Was giant Gilgamesh found intact in his tomb after the Euphrates River dried up? Bible enthusiasts have always been captivated by archaeological excavations, which are not just hobby projects, but also important attempts to shed light on the setting and historical context of the Bible. A highly remarkable assertion made in the past few years is the purported finding of Gilgamesh's tomb, a legendary character from ancient Mesopotamian culture. Not only is the discovery remarkable, but the estimated bulk of the bones, which aligns with accounts of Gilgamesh's enormous stature, has generated a great deal of debate in the fields of biblical and archaeological studies. The Bible makes extensive use of the Euphrates River, from its mention in Genesis's creation story to its function as the Promised Land's border. Therefore, it's intriguing that what some claim to be Gilgamesh's tomb would be revealed when the Euphrates dried up. The geographical location provides an intriguing connection to the biblical story, acting as a hub for the interaction of the Bible with more extensive ancient Near Eastern culture. The claim is indeed extraordinary. A tomb of considerable size, suggesting an occupant who was about nine feet six inches tall. While it's important to approach such claims with scholarly caution, the size does align with the epic's description of Gilgamesh as two-thirds divine and one-third human, physically imposing and larger than life. This has sparked discussions about giants in ancient history and how this aligns with the biblical narrative. Giants are mentioned in the Bible, but not all giants are created equal. Often used as examples are the Anakim and the Rephaim. However, these should not be confused with the Nephilim, who were the descendants of fallen angels and human women, and perished in the flood. For this reason, the finding of a massive tomb supposedly belonging to Gilgamesh cannot be automatically classified as part of the Nephilim. Making these kinds of distinctions is crucial to correctly comprehending the biblical text, the Gilgamesh epic and the biblical flood account. Another interesting intersection between the Bible and the Gilgamesh epic is the story of the flood. While the Mesopotamian account is markedly different from the biblical narrative, the parallels suggest a common memory of a catastrophic flood. If the tomb indeed belongs to Gilgamesh, it would mean that he lived after the flood, aligning with the biblical timeline that also places the Tower of Babel and the subsequent dispersion and confusion of language post-flood. The integrity of the research process is of utmost importance to us 
as conservative Bible archaeologists. To verify the claim, a thorough investigation involving radiocarbon dating, DNA analysis, and comparative skeletal morphology must be carried out. When a discovery this dramatic is proposed, the historical grammatical method of interpretation demands no less. It's important to keep in mind that this discovery is still only a hypothesis until it is further confirmed, despite its potentially enormous implications. It is vital not to let the allure of such discoveries overshadow the primacy and authority of scripture. While archaeological finds can provide additional context or even confirmation of biblical events or characters, they should not serve as the foundation for faith. The Bible remains the inspired, inerrant Word of God, fully capable of standing on its own merit. This discovery has sparked debates among theologians and lay Christians in addition to the archaeological community. It might improve our comprehension of the historical and cultural setting in which the Bible was composed. But it also demands a spirit of discernment that is based on a literal reading of the Bible. The alleged discovery of Gilgamesh's tomb near the Euphrates River raises questions that intersect fascinatingly with the biblical narrative. While the size of the remains could mistakenly lead some to associate them with the Nephilim, a careful reading of scripture indicates this cannot be the case. As with all archaeological discoveries, this one demands rigorous verification to determine its authenticity and subsequent relevance to the biblical narrative. Whether it proves to be a monumental find or a cautionary tale in the annals of biblical archaeology, its immediate impact serves as a reminder of the enduring intrigue of the ancient world and its interplay with the sacred text. The Euphrates River dried up, the momentous discovery. When the Euphrates River's waters receded, what lay exposed was more than just a newly revealed stretch of land. In an era where each archaeological find can evoke everything from scholarly excitement to public wonder, the discovery of a tomb attributable no less to the mighty Gilgamesh of ancient lore stands as a momentous event. This chapter delves into the particularities of this find, focusing primarily on the physical characteristics of the tomb's occupant and the artifacts that accompany it. The enormity of the tomb attracted attention right away. Estimates indicate that the tomb was intended to hold a figure that was about 9 feet 6 inches tall. Though the Bible frequently alludes to extraordinarily tall characters like Goliath, this discovery elevates the discussion to a whole new plane. If the bones are human, they are of a size that is beyond explanation. It is important to proceed with caution, even though it is tempting to hastily refer to this figure as a giant, a term loaded with biblical connotations. Skeletal features can provide significant insight into the life, health, and even societal role of individuals from antiquity. Early reports indicate bones of extraordinary size, but proportionate to human anatomy. This is not some monstrous or malformed skeleton. This is a human-like figure, but on a grand scale. Theological implications are profound, as it aligns well with accounts of giants within Scripture, though not the Nephilim, who were destroyed in Noah's flood. Therefore, a direct association with post-flood biblical figures becomes more plausible. A variety of artifacts that spoke volumes about the culture and time period of the tomb's occupant were arranged around the skeletal remains. Preliminary analyses point to Mesopotamian craftsmanship in jewelry, pottery, and even simple weapons. These objects have two functions. They first provide cultural context for ancient Mesopotamia. Secondly, they offer a foundation for understanding the individual's importance. Such relics may help us better comprehend the local geopolitics that Genesis and other books of the Bible describe. Perhaps the most puzzling discovery is the presence of inscriptions within the tomb. Though yet to be deciphered fully, these writings could potentially shed light 
on the identity of the tomb's occupant. The presence of a written language aligns with the biblical understanding of early post-flood societies as being advanced in various domains, including writing. The indications of regality are not to be overlooked. The tomb has elaborate carvings and what seem to be the remains of a headpiece or crown. These details imply that the occupant was not only a powerful physical presence, but also a member of a distinguished social class, possibly even royalty. The royal indicators would line up perfectly if this is in fact Gilgamesh, the renowned king of Uruk, strengthening the connection between the discovery and the Mesopotamian epics. If we accept the premise that the tomb could belong to Gilgamesh, it casts the character as more than a mythological figure. From a biblical standpoint, this could offer further proof that the giants mentioned in the Old Testament were historical figures and not mere folklore. It would also validate the notion that stories of giants existed in cultures outside of the Israelites, thereby illustrating a shared historical memory that transcends cultural boundaries. The discovery of a massive tomb near the dry Euphrates riverbed has sparked a lot of inquiries and conjecture. Even though it can be tempting to jump to conclusions, doing your research is crucial. The significance of this discovery will be ascertained through scientific examinations of the skeletal remains and artifacts analyzed in the context of scripture. By dissecting the giant's body and examining the related items, we are getting closer to confirming or disproving a link to the legendary Gilgamesh. Whichever way things turn out, we will undoubtedly have a deeper understanding of the ancient world and the biblical story that so closely intersects it. The mystery of the giant Gilgamesh and its biblical significance. The enigmatic figure of Gilgamesh has fascinated scholars, theologians, and archaeologists alike for generations. While ancient texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh portray this figure as a demigod and hero of Uruk in Mesopotamia, the question remains, was Gilgamesh a real historical figure, and what is his biblical significance? The intriguing possibility that the myths surrounding Gilgamesh might have some basis in historical events has been a point of discussion within the realm of biblical archaeology. In scholarly circles, Gilgamesh is not merely a character out of Mesopotamian mythology. The tales and epics revolving around him serve as important historical documents that provide insights into ancient Mesopotamian culture, religion, and social norms. But the issue at hand is not merely about understanding Mesopotamian history. It also touches on the much grander issue of the validity and reliability of biblical accounts. The Epic of Gilgamesh is primarily a work of mythology, but it also presents historical and geographical contexts that are important to consider. One well-documented archaeological site is the city of Uruk. It makes sense that, if Gilgamesh existed, he would have lived in a time period that was compatible with the location and events that the epic describes. Thus, it's not totally implausible that the question of his historicity exists. For those committed to the objective historical grammatical method of interpretation, the possibility that Gilgamesh was a real figure opens up interesting avenues of exploration regarding biblical accuracy. If Gilgamesh was indeed a real historical individual, could his story somehow align with or be explained by biblical narratives? For instance, was he a post-flood giant distinct from the Nephilim who were wiped out in the global deluge described in the book of Genesis? Or could he have been one of the mighty men mentioned in Genesis 10 who emerged after the flood? These are not just fanciful questions. They go to the heart of whether or not the Bible can be trusted as a source of historical information. The Bible does not hold back when talking about giants. We come across references to exceptionally tall people or groups such as Goliath and the Anakim after the flood. Since the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood, they were not Nephilim, 
the offspring of fallen angels and human women. Any post-flood giants must therefore be regarded as separate from them. Examining the potential that Gilgamesh was one of these post-flood giants would confirm the biblical text's historical accuracy. So what's next? I mean, the future of biblical archaeology, as it relates to the quest to find the historical Gilgamesh, the field of biblical archaeology has much to look forward to. Advances in technology such as ground-penetrating radar and sophisticated dating techniques provide better tools for excavation and analysis. Global collaborations between experts in archaeology, Assyriology, and textual criticism could pave the way for more comprehensive research. New sites may yet be discovered that provide more substantial evidence for or against the historical existence of Gilgamesh. Furthermore, the abundance of unread tablets and inscriptions can be deciphered more quickly thanks to the digitization of ancient texts and the application of AI for pattern recognition and language translation. These might contain hints about Gilgamesh as well as the larger setting in which he might have existed. In summary, while we cannot with certainty affirm the historicity of Gilgamesh based on current evidence, the evolving field of biblical archaeology holds the promise of new discoveries that may one day provide a more definitive answer. Whether we eventually confirm or disprove the historical existence of Gilgamesh, the journey itself enriches our understanding of the ancient world, offering valuable insights that resonate across the disciplines of archaeology, theology, and ancient history. Donald Trump has made various statements related to the end times, often in the context of his engagements with evangelical Christian leaders and supporters. However, his comments on this topic have generally been brief and not extensively detailed. During his presidency, Trump was known for his outreach to evangelical Christians and for speaking at events and gatherings where religious themes, including the end times, were discussed. In these settings, he often expressed support for religious freedom and the protection of Christian values, which are topics that resonate with some interpretations of end times theology. Do you remember? In a 2015 interview with Christian Broadcasting Network, Trump stated that Christians were chopped off in the Middle East and that Christianity was under siege. While not a direct reference to the end times, these comments reflect a concern for the persecution of Christians, which is a theme often associated with end times narratives in some Christian traditions the Euphrates River, drying up. Is it a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? The Euphrates River drying up, a headline we're seeing more frequently. Looking at this from a surface level, it speaks of the ongoing birth pangs we see around the world. However, this news has also garnered attention from many Christians familiar with Bible prophecy for other legitimate reasons, as the Euphrates River will play an important role during the tribulation. Some are saying that the current drying of the Euphrates River is fulfilling Bible prophecy, but is this truly the case? What they primarily point to to make this case is Revelation 16.12, a description of the Sixth Bowl Judgment. Although Revelation 16.12 does indeed talk about the Euphrates River drying up, it elaborates this to us in a specific context. First, it takes place during the Tribulation period and more specifically towards the end, as it's the second to last bowl judgment. Second, we see that the drying up of the Euphrates at this point in time isn't caused by natural means, such as a rise in temperature or an increase in severity of droughts. What scripture elaborates to us is that this will be done via the means of a supernatural source. The sixth bowl judgment poured out on the river by an angel, which is ultimately an expression of God's wrath. Third, the Bible not only provides the context as to when this will happen, but why this happens, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. The following verses then detail to us the gathering of the kings of the whole earth to the battle of Armageddon. 
Essentially, what this shows us is that the drying up of the Euphrates is connected to the armies of the world readying for this battle. It's one judgment which sets up another judgment rendered by Christ in person to overwhelming defeat these armies, known as the winepress of the wrath of God. So is what's currently occurring to the Euphrates River a fulfillment of the sixth bowl judgment in Revelation 16? To say that would not only mean we're currently in the tribulation, but that all of the seal, trumpet, and majority of bowl judgments have been poured out on mankind, and that three demonic spirits have gone out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to the battle of Armageddon in anticipation of Christ's second coming. What we're witnessing now, along with a plethora of other signs, is a shadow of what's to come during the tribulation. Aside from Revelation 16, we also see the significance of the Euphrates River during the tribulation in Revelation 9, with the sixth trumpet judgment, which I elaborate on in this article. What we see from Scripture starting in Genesis is a focus on the Middle East in the beginning, and in Revelation, the focus is brought right back to that region of the earth. It's clear to us that the Euphrates River drying up is significant due to the yet-to-be-fulfilled prophecies concerning it, so it's not necessary to force a fulfillment upon it. What this should show us instead is that when we consider this along with the many prophetic signs converging on our time, it acts as a marker of where we are prophetically, which should strengthen our faith in God's Word and excite us as our blessed hope draws near. Recently, a hot topic has been the matter of the Euphrates River drying up. The most common reason why the Euphrates River is drying up is because of low rainfall, drought, and climate change. With the drying up of the Euphrates River, many are wondering if this is linked to biblical prophecy. It is important to understand biblical prophecy contained within the Old Testament before we come to conclusions concerning the Euphrates River. The Bible mentions the Euphrates River numerous times. This long river has played an important role in history. It also has spiritual significance. The Euphrates River has fascinating symbolic meaning in the Bible and is mentioned in biblical prophecies about it drying up as well. The Bible often mentions the Euphrates River as a geographical marker, but it also describes the river's significance as a symbol of God's power over the natural world that he has created. The Euphrates River is a complex symbol in the Bible. It reminds us that God exercises both love and judgment. In various verses, the Bible mentions the Euphrates River in ways that speak of both hope and destruction. It is often mentioned in connection with the history and geography of the ancient civilizations it flowed through, as well as in prophetic passages that speak of future events. Yes, there are many biblical prophecies linked with the Euphrates River drying up. One of these is Isaiah 11:15. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. He will break it up into seven streams so that anyone can cross over in sandals. As Isaiah says in this passage, the Lord will supernaturally dry up the Euphrates River. Since the present drying up of the Euphrates River is related to low rainfall, drought, and climate change, and not by God's doing, this passage is not being fulfilled in the modern day. This passage is actually referring to the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. Jesus is the one who sweeps his hand over the Euphrates River for everyone to be able to cross over. Since this is referring to the Millennial Kingdom, this cannot be fulfilled in the present day. It is a future prophecy specifically referring to the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. A second biblical prophecy referring to the Euphrates River is Revelation 16.12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This passage of scripture refers to the event of the sixth bowl judgment, which will occur during the tribulation. 
The Bible predicts that, in the last days, the Euphrates River will dry up to prepare the way for the kings of the east to pass through. The river itself is a massive land barrier that would hinder any army from advancing east to west. At more than 1,800 miles long and an average of 300 yards wide, the Euphrates River has been a substantial source of life in the region. The Sixth Bowl Judgment happens toward the end of the Tribulation, which is the worst part of the Tribulation. It will be a terrible judgment when the waters of the Euphrates River will be completely dried up because the people will no longer have water. This drying up of the Euphrates River will be supernaturally done by God as judgment to the people. The people will curse God and continue in their sins despite God's efforts to bring his children back to him throughout the course of the tribulation. John predicts in Revelation 9, 16, 18 that these kings of the East will boast a standing army of 200 million. This is a bold prophecy. It's also worth noting that whatever the kings of the East are, they are seen as a formidable force in the end times and are going to be part of the final battles that will take place before the return of Jesus. Either way, this massive army will need to cross the Euphrates on their way to the Valley of Armageddon. Spiritually, Bible scholars have offered various interpretations of Bible passages about the Euphrates River drying up. Some see it as a symbol of the decline and fall of the Babylonian Empire, which was a powerful force in the ancient world, but eventually lost its dominance. Others see it as a sign of the end times, which lead up to when Jesus will return to judge the world and separate the righteous from the wicked. In that interpretation, the Euphrates River drying up may point to the unleashing of the forces of darkness on the world. It could be referring to when the Antichrist will gather his armies to invade Israel. In that scenario, the dry riverbed of the Euphrates can allow the armies to cross the river and attack Israel. We don't know precisely when that will happen, but pondering the Euphrates drying up during the end times, whenever that actually takes place, is a sobering reminder that God is in control of history. He will bring judgment on the world for its sin, but he will also protect his people. We can trust in God, even in the midst of the darkest of times. Ultimately, the biblical meaning of the Euphrates drying up is a matter of interpretation and debate. What is clear, however, is that the image of the river running dry is a powerful symbol of the spiritual dryness that can afflict people who turn away from God. The solution for spiritual dryness is a relationship with God, who is our living water, the strange sound. Continuing the story of terrible prophecies in the Bible, sounds emanate from underground like a warning bell of events to come. Is it the sound of the four fallen angels? Are they about to be released? An ancient tunnel was discovered that leads to the underground with a very perfect building structure, which also has stairs which are neatly arranged and are still intact to this day. Some say that this is a relic of ancient people that is still preserved today. However, a rumor among the locals is that the tunnel leads to where the angels are imprisoned. As mentioned in the Bible, to be precise, in Revelation 9.13, 19. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, 
a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. In the book of the Revelation, the Euphrates is revealed as being the location of four mighty, destructive messengers, bound for centuries, but set to be loosed upon the earth to unleash an unprecedented savage fury the world has never seen before, nor will it ever see again. By the time the pent-up fury of these angles is spent, one-third of all mankind will have been killed. These four angels are also satanic angels, for they have been bound because of past sin. They have not, like the previous group, been bound in the bottomless pit, but in the great river Euphrates, so apparently their particular sin was at a different time and place. Perhaps this particular horde of fallen angels with their four captains had been associated with the first great human rebellion after the Flood, when Nimrod led mankind to rebel against God at Babel, located on the Euphrates. As a result, God had scattered the people around the world, confusing their tongues. The invisible host of heaven, however, who had instigated this rebellion and whom Nimrod had sought to worship in his great temple tower, built unto heaven, that is, with a shrine dedicated to the host of heaven, the angels and their starry realms, had not been scattered. Rather, they were confined to the Euphrates where they had established their base. This, of course, is not stated in scripture, but seems a plausible explanation of why Babylon and its environs seems ever since to have been the greatest enemy of God and his people. Tomb of King Gilgamesh. In scholarly circles, Gilgamesh is not merely a character out of Mesopotamian mythology. The tales and epics revolving around him serve as important historical documents that provide insights into ancient Mesopotamian culture, religion, and social norms. But the issue at hand is not merely about understanding Mesopotamian history, it also touches on the much grander issue of the validity and reliability of biblical accounts. In the years following George Smith's groundbreaking work, deciphering the Epic of Gilgamesh, the scholarly and archaeological world buzzed with questions about the real-life existence of this mythic king. The next logical step was to look for material evidence that could confirm or disprove the historicity of Gilgamesh. And where else to begin this quest but by searching for his tomb? According to the text itself, Gilgamesh was laid to rest somewhere in the city of Uruk, close to the Euphrates River, a location with biblical importance as well. The astounding discovery of the ancient Mesopotamian city of Gilgamesh, which was unearthed after the Euphrates River fully dried up, has astonished the entire globe in recent years. This finding led to the city's location. This incredible find at an archaeological site has not only cast fresh light on one of the most intriguing and enigmatic people in the annals of human history, but has also prompted tremendous interest and debate among academics, historians, and members of the general public alike. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, archaeological expeditions began targeting Mesopotamian sites, hoping to unearth clues that would offer insights into ancient history. Various teams explored the ruins of Uruk, sifting through layers of history in a painstaking manner, ever watchful for signs of the monumental tomb of the legendary king. These were the days when archaeology was still a young science, but the methods employed were increasingly systematic and governed by a framework that would come to define modern archaeological practice. Several promising artifacts and architectural remains were found during these early excavations. Though none could be definitively linked to Gilgamesh, they provided tantalizing hints. Objects that bore royal inscriptions, monumental walls and buildings, suggestive of great wealth and power, and burial sites with remarkable artifacts. All these made the possibility of finding Gilgamesh's tomb seem ever more likely. 
The journey of this finding continued when archaeologists in Iraq in 2003 were reportedly of the belief that they may have discovered the lost tomb of Gilgamesh, ruler of the ancient Sumerian city of Uruk and the subject of the oldest recorded story in history. Archaeologists discovered the tomb of Gilgamesh in Iraq, potentially changing our understanding of the legendary figure and the epic of Gilgamesh. A German-led expedition reported that it had discovered what was thought to be the entire city of Uruk, including the last resting place of its famous king, where it would have been surrounded by the waters of the Euphrates before the river changed its course. I don't want to say definitely that it was the grave of Gilgamesh, but it looks very similar to that described in the epic, said Jörg Fassbinder, of the Bavarian Department of Historical Monuments in Munich. In the story, which is recorded on a set of inscribed clay tablets, Gilgamesh is described as having been buried under the Euphrates, in a tomb which was apparently constructed when the waters of the ancient river parted following his death. We found just outside the city, in an area in the middle of the former Euphrates River, the remains of such a building which could be interpreted as a burial, Mr. Fassbinder said. The most surprising thing was that we found structures which had already been described in the Gilgamesh epic, Mr. Fassbinder also stated. We covered more than a hundred hectares. We have found garden structures and field structures as described in the epic, and we found Babylonian houses. After all, early excavations searching for the tomb of Gilgamesh near the Euphrates River have not only furthered our understanding of ancient Mesopotamia, but have also provided a significant context for biblical studies. The mere act of searching for this tomb in the vicinity of the Euphrates offers a compelling blend of historical curiosity and theological inquiry. While the tomb remains elusive, the pursuit itself, marked by both challenges and breakthroughs, serves to deepen our understanding of the complex tapestry of human history, of which the Bible is a central part. Future excavations may yet yield the prize that has tantalized scholars for decades, and if and when that happens, it will undoubtedly open up new dialogues between the fields of archaeology and biblical studies. The ancient city, the bustling metropolis of Zakiku, a significant city in the Mitanni Empire, once stood beneath the Euphrates River in the amazing ancient city that is today known as Kemune. From roughly 1600 BCE to 1260 BCE, this ancient empire stood mighty alongside other important nations like Babylonia and Egypt. However, the Assyrians assumed control as the empire started to crumble and the Mitanni people were forgotten. Researchers found a large fortification with towers, an industrial complex, and a massive storage facility with numerous levels during their face-paced digs. The immense scale of the storage building suggests that it originally housed a staggering amount of things, indicating the potential size and status of the ancient city and its inhabitants. But what really stood out was how well kept the structures are. The almost three zero 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 year old walls were built from sun-dried mud, which should have long since disintegrated beneath the Euphrates River's waters. The higher portions of the walls were devastated and reduced to rubble, however, by an earthquake that occurred approximately 1350 BCE. The lowest portions of the walls were covered in debris, which shielded them from the water. A number of pottery vessels were also discovered and recovered by the archaeology team in addition to the walls and substantial buildings. These had more than 100 cuneiform written tablets inside of them, which is the world's earliest writing format. Some of the clay encased tablets were still there and ready for reading. These old clay tablets, which have been miraculously preserved across thousands of years and even decades underwater, should help us learn more about the inhabitants who previously called this ancient city home. The Mitanni Empire, which was one of the most powerful states of its era, was established in Mesopotamia and Syria somewhere between 1500 and 1600 BCE. 
It began in northern Iraq, traveled into Syria, and ended up in Turkey. The distance between the Zagros Mountains and the glistening Mediterranean Sea was more than 600 miles. The term Mitanni may have originated from the fact that the empire was ruled by warriors going by the name Marianu. The Hittites referred to the kingdom as the land of the Huri because the inhabitants were Hurian. Marianu, however, was rendered as Naharin and Mitanni by the Egyptians. Between 1500 and 1240 BCE, the Mitanni Empire flourished and ruled the northern Euphrates Tigris region. Along with the headwaters at Nineveh and the upper Tigris River, it also controlled significant trade routes up the Euphrates to Carchemish and down the harbor to Mari. However, you might be perplexed as to why so few people can recall this formidable and impressive empire. Well, the majority of the Mitanni cities and their antiquities were destroyed when the Assyrians conquered in the 14th century. Unfortunately, the Mitanni people's own documents were largely destroyed. In actuality, there were only three primary sources of Mitanni history before the recent discovery beneath the Euphrates River, the Letters of Amarna, a pact between the Hittites and the Mitanni Empire, and a historical horse handbook. Like so many other ancient civilizations, the Mitanni Empire was formed by a variety of influences, which ultimately caused it to fall. For instance, vassals and tributes were used to manage the complicated political and social system of the empire. The stability of the empire was frequently broken by a tremendous degree of strife and power conflicts between numerous kings and factions. The Mitanni Empire was also surrounded by a number of strong and fearsome foes. The empire was frequently assaulted by the Assyrians, Hittites, and Kassites who lived nearby. The Mitanni Empire and its economy were severely weakened by these repeated invasions, which frequently disrupted trade routes. The Assyrian invasions continued into the 14th century BCE, battering the already failing empire until they finally gained total control. The Islamic Prophecy Muslim believe what the Prophet said about the existence of golden mountains in the Hadith concerning the Euphrates River. The beginning of each river originates from different places. However, all waters and rivers come from the treasury of Allah's mercy. As a matter of fact, it is rumored that some of the rivers come from heaven. Among the hadiths related to some portents of the apocalypse, there are also those related to the Euphrates River and its waters. It is rumored that there is a great secret hidden under the Euphrates, and this secret will be revealed when the time of the apocalypse approaches. Our Prophet spoke of such an issue in his hadiths. When the time comes, the mystery under the river will come to light and countries will fight each other for possession of it. Chances are, the waters of the Euphrates will recede and dry up. A golden treasure will be revealed. Whoever is found there will not get anything. Muslim Fatin 30 Or, the waters of the Euphrates will recede and a mountain will emerge from underneath. People will fight to get it and only one out of every hundred will survive. Doomsday will not come until this time comes. Muslim Fitan 29. There are hadiths reported by our Prophet that there is a great secret under the Euphrates River. This secret is so important and valuable as to cause confusion among countries. When the time comes, the waters of the Euphrates will dry up and a golden mountain will appear on its bed. This mountain will cause a war between people and only one person out of every hundred will be able to survive. The opening of the Euphrates over a golden mountain is imminent. When people hear this, they will walk to him and he will say that if we let the people next to him take something from it, it will all be taken away. Then they will fight for him and 99 out of every hundred people will be killed. 
This hadith is undoubtedly the truth and will happen. The problem is, no one knows exactly about the exact location of the Golden Mountain. It is still hidden because it is a sign of the apocalypse. In this regard, Ibn Hajar said that the receding of the Euphrates River would occur before the appearance of Al-Mahdi. Similarly, it is mentioned in the book of Al-Burhan. So there is a time set by Allah when he will reveal it. No one will know it until it is completely cast out by Allah himself. And now, the event that our Prophet mentioned in this hadith is seen as a harbinger of doomsday. Many people starting from the hadiths have taken action to find this treasure. However, it is not known in which part of the 2,800 kilometers long Euphrates River this treasure mentioned by our Prophet is located. It is said that the Golden Mountain, which is said to be under the Euphrates, will show itself when the time comes. There is also a belief that there are great treasures underground and that they will be revealed by Hazrat Mahdi when the doomsday approaches. For this reason, some scholars believe that the treasure in the Euphrates will be revealed in the time of Hazrat Mahdi. The Euphrates River has an important place not only for Muslims, but also for world history and religions. In the Torah, it is told that after Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden, a river emerged from Eden and split into four branches, and the third of these four branches was the Euphrates, and the fourth was the Tigris River. In the Bible, the Euphrates River plays an important role, and the importance of the Euphrates River is emphasized in the Revelation part where the signs of the Apocalypse are told. For this reason, the discovery of a great treasure hidden under the Euphrates is of great importance for people of different faiths. This brings to mind the question that the cause of the turmoil in the Middle East may be related to these rivers. The Euphrates River, which has played a crucial role in shaping the history of Iraq, is slowly disappearing and leaving many people worried. This once thriving river has been the lifeblood of countless communities for centuries, but now it's drying up at an alarming rate. Along with its sister river, the Tigris, the Euphrates is causing concern among scientists, environmentalists, and those who depend on it for their survival. What's causing this strange phenomenon? What is the intriguing discovery of mysterious caves beneath the Euphrates? The Euphrates River holds immense historical significance, dating back to the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia. It played a crucial role in developing human societies, providing water for irrigation, transportation, and a source of livelihood for countless communities in the region. The fertile lands surrounding the Euphrates River were home to the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians who built magnificent cities and established complex societies. The river was a physical presence and a symbol of life and prosperity. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers have been experiencing a concerning drying trend in recent years. This phenomenon has raised serious concerns among scientists as it threatens the delicate balance of the region's ecosystem and the livelihoods of millions of people. The drying up of these rivers is attributed to a combination of factors, including reduced rainfall, increased water usage for agriculture, and the construction of dams upstream. The consequences of this drying up are far-reaching, affecting not only the availability of water for irrigation, but also the preservation of wildlife and the overall sustainability of the region. Amidst the vanishing act of the Euphrates River, reports of mysterious caves beneath its waters have come to light. These reports have intrigued explorers, scientists, and adventure enthusiasts alike. An underwater city was discovered by a team of divers, adding to the enigma surrounding the disappearance of the river. The city, believed to be ancient and submerged for centuries, has sparked debates and theories about its origins and the possible connection to the vanishing of the Euphrates River. The exploration of these caves has become an area of intense interest, 
with individuals like well, Kenny Veach gaining recognition for his daring exploration of the Davis. cave, a cave system rumored to be connected to the Euphrates River. The discovery of an underwater city has captured the world's imagination. This ancient city, submerged beneath the Euphrates River for centuries, has raised numerous questions about its origins, purpose, and connection to the disappearing river. Archaeologists and historians work tirelessly to uncover the secrets within the city's walls. The findings from this underwater excavation could rewrite the history books and shed light on the enigmatic disappearance of the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River's disappearance has been shrouded in mystery and it piqued the interest of adventurers and explorers. Kenny Veach focused his efforts on exploring the cave, a system of caves that were believed to contain clues about the river's disappearance. However, Kenny's disappearance during his expedition added another level of intrigue to the enigmatic puzzles surrounding the vanishing of the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River's disappearance and the sudden emergence of mysterious caves have sparked a flurry of theories and speculations. Some people believe that natural causes like climate change and geological shifts are responsible for the river drying up and the caves forming. Others think that human activities like excessive dam construction and overuse of water resources are to blame. And then some believe that supernatural or extraterrestrial forces are behind this strange phenomenon. Regardless of how plausible these theories are, they all contribute to the ongoing mystery surrounding the vanishing act of the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River's receding water levels reveal ancient caves resembling prison bars that have been sealed due to mysterious sounds, potentially connected to biblical prophecy and the secret tomb of King Gilgamesh, challenging the belief that he was fictional. The discovery of a cave filled with hidden treasures under the Euphrates River has the potential to cause economic, political, and social upheaval, as well as shed light on ancient religious beliefs and rituals. Ancient tunnels under the Euphrates River in Turkey have been discovered, revealing historical truths and raising concerns about dangerous creatures while providing valuable insights into the lives and beliefs of the people in the region. As the waters of the Euphrates have been receding, people have been venturing into territories that previously had been inaccessible before. What they are finding are caves or caverns that seem like they could have held someone or something prisoner at one time. In these areas, archaeologists have been recording sounds coming from the ground, sounds that make your skin crawl because they remind you of the monsters in your nightmares. Groans, moans, and growls can be heard on these recordings, and even what seems to be something moving around with chains connected to it. Could these be the fallen ones preparing to be released from their chambers under the great Euphrates? Will they come, and if they do, will they truly take a third of human existence with them? Hold on to your chairs as we play the horrifying sounds of fallen angels gearing up for their vengeful return. The four angels whom someone had bound are evil angels. These evil angels are agents of the devil, and they only carry out wicked and cruel acts. That is why it was necessary to bind them. God would not permit them to do anything until it was necessary for this terrible judgment to happen. In Revelation 9.13, 19, the sixth angel trumpeted. I heard a voice speaking to the sixth angel from the horns of the golden altar before God. Let the four angels loose, the angels confined at the great river Euphrates. The four angels were untied and let loose, four angels all prepared for the exact year, month, day, and even hour when they were to kill a third of the human race. 
the number of the army of horsemen was twice ten thousand times ten thousand. I heard the count and saw both horses and riders in my vision. Fiery breastplates on the riders, lion heads on the horses, breathing out fire and smoke and brimstone. With these three weapons, fire and smoke and brimstone, they killed a third of the human race. The horses killed with their mouths and tails. Their serpent-like tails also had heads that wreaked havoc. Revelation 9.14 Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which abound in the great river Euphrates. The text reveals that when the four angels are released at the great river Euphrates, all hell breaks loose in a worldwide war. This sixth judgment will be sharp and overwhelming, a third of mankind will be slain. Under the third seal, a fourth part was slain, and now a third of the remaining three-fourths are slain. What a bloodbath awaits the inhabitants of all the territory associated with the Euphrates. In Old Testament times, God used this river figuratively to overrun the land of his people with their enemies. The river was a symbol of the destructive onrush of the Assyrians to execute divine judgments upon Israel. As used by John, this same river is the site of God's judgment on the unsaved world, although the destruction is limited to the third part. The Euphrates was where human sin began and where Satan held dominion for so long. Now it endures divine scourge. There is a definite article attached to the four angels, identifying them specifically, although scripture does not furnish these angels. In Revelation 7, 1, it is mentioned, the four angels at the four corners of the earth were different ones as they were not bound. When the moment comes for their release, evil forces are loose against a world that has forsaken God and his word. We can be sure that the forces of the Antichrist are also pitted against the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, even though they bear God's seal and receive his spiritual protection. Jesus said that if the days of great distress were not shortened, no one would survive or no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God is the agent who commands the release of these four angels. The number four signifies worldwide impact, as is evident from the destruction that these angels induce. A third part of the world's population perishes. This is a picture of a war that encompasses the entire world as it faces God's judgment. All along, God had kept in check the forces of global destruction of humanity. Albeit he had sent calamities on a third of the earth, trees, the creatures of the sea, the ships, the waters, and the heavenly bodies. He also increases the intensity of his judgments. Following the opening of the fourth seal, death and Hades are given authority over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and famine and disease and by the wild beasts of the earth. But now we read that a third part of the earth's population is slain. This scourge is so severe that these people long to die but cannot because death slips away from them. Then as a result of the next plague, a third of mankind perishes. You know what? The discoveries under the Euphrates do not stop at the strange sound that we heard. There are a lot of important secrets. Archaeologists discovered the tomb of Gilgamesh in Iraq, potentially changing our understanding of the legendary figure and the epic of Gilgamesh. The discovery of the Epic of Gilgamesh in the library of Ashurbanipal in 1849 sparked renewed interest in Mesopotamian archaeology and ancient civilization. The Epic of Gilgamesh offers profound insights into friendship and the quest for immortality, leading to the discovery of Gilgamesh's tomb in modern-day Iraq, with George Smith playing a key role in translating the Epic and shedding light on ancient Mesopotamian civilization. The discovery of ancient Babylonian tablets by Smith sparked interest in the Epic of Gilgamesh and influenced biblical narratives, 
but his second expedition was cut short by his death in Syria. The Epic of Gilgamesh and the biblical story of Noah's Flood share similarities in the deliberate decision by the gods or God to send a flood to wipe out humanity, with both featuring a single individual chosen by the divine to survive the flood. Yorgfast Bender's discovery of King Gilgamesh's tomb in Iraq closely resembles the descriptions from the ancient text, containing stone sculptures, tablets, an alabaster statue, and a plant with rejuvenation powers. Researchers found artifacts in Uruk, solidifying the belief in the historical events of Gilgamesh and Enkidu with glimpses into their lives and adventures. A statue of Gilgamesh was unearthed in the tomb. Strangely enough, this statue wore a watch-like object in its hand and held an adult lion. This evidence suggests that this may have been where Gilgamesh ruled and that he may have actually existed, because according to Sumerian records, Gilgamesh was the fifth king of Uruk recorded in the Sumerian king list. He was considered the son of Lugabanda and the son of the goddess Ningsong. He is also known as the King of Heroes because of his strength and courage far beyond ordinary people. In the epic, Gilgamesh is described as possessing two-thirds God's blood and one-third human blood, meaning he has the wisdom and strength of the gods, but does not have the longevity of the gods. Gilgamesh ruled very cruelly over his people, forcing young people into slavery. So the people called on the gods for help and the gods created Enkidu, a wild man to confront and stop Gilgamesh's brutality. Enkidu goes to Uruk and has a fierce fight with Gilgamesh. Eventually, the two become friends regardless of the outcome. From then on, Gilgamesh changes his behavior, begins to care for his people, and goes on adventures with Enkidu, defeat many monsters and enemies. He also searched for the law of immortality and left behind a book of wisdom. If these stories are true, then Gilgamesh is not just a mythical character, but a real giant. If so, the tomb is not only an archaeological discovery, but could also change our understanding of history and human origins. Because according to the records of Sumerian civilization, Anunnaki is a type of high-class creature from extraterrestrials. And if these stories are true, then humans are not the result of natural evolution, but rather alien experiments. And Gilgamesh may have had strength and intelligence far beyond humans. He may have found a way to live forever and may have mastered advanced technology. These are the things that make people extremely curious and eager to explore. Is the drying up of the Euphrates River the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Recent news articles have reported that the Euphrates River is indeed drying up. The river's flow has decreased by more than 60% over the past century due to dams and irrigation projects in Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. There's also been an unknown factor that has caused it to increase that no one can explain. The drying up of the Euphrates River is a clear fulfillment of Bible prophecy and a sign that we must be ready for Jesus' return. As stated in Matthew 24, 44, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. When you dive into the Bible's text, it's clear that the Euphrates River holds a significant place often mentioned in Genesis, where it's described as one of four rivers branching from the river flowing out of Eden. History buffs might be fascinated to learn that this places it right at humanity's cradle. But what happens when we flip to Revelation? Something is intriguing there. The scripture prophecies that the water of the river was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now doesn't that spark curiosity? What could happen after this mighty river dries up? In biblical prophecies, water often symbolizes life and prosperity. So when a crucial river like Euphrates dries up, it implies an arrival of desolation or judgment. 
It's not meant to paint an apocalyptic picture, but rather to emphasize a transition phase preceding God's ultimate victory. This prophecy also introduces the kings from the East. Scholars have varying interpretations about who they are. Some believe these kings represent powerful nations set on causing havoc. Meanwhile, others think they are God's instruments for executing judgment. So here we are, with a key river running dry and mysterious eastern kings on their way, thrown into a whirlwind of unfolding events. The drying up of Euphrates is more than just ecological change. It signifies major shifts on spiritual and geopolitical fronts according to the biblical context. Diving right into it, let's talk about what happens after the Euphrates River dries up according to biblical prophecy. It's not a minor event, folks. Many interpret this as symbolic language, suggesting a way being made for armies to cross over for an epic battle. Some theorize that this drying up signifies an end-time war, potentially World War III. Others suggest it may be more metaphorical, pointing towards political or social changes in the nations surrounding the river. When you dive into the Bible's text, it's clear that the Euphrates River holds a significant place, often mentioned in Genesis, where it's described as one of four rivers branching from the river flowing out of Eden. History buffs might be fascinated to learn that this places it right at humanity's cradle. But what happens when we flip to Revelation? Something is intriguing there. The scripture prophecies that the water of the river was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, doesn't that spark curiosity? What could happen after this mighty river dries up? In biblical prophecies, water often symbolizes life and prosperity. So when a crucial river like Euphrates dries up, it implies an arrival of desolation or judgment. It's not meant to paint an apocalyptic picture, but rather to emphasize a transition phase preceding God's ultimate victory. This prophecy also introduces the kings from the East. Scholars have varying interpretations about who they are. Some believe these kings represent powerful nations set on causing havoc. Meanwhile, others think they are God's instruments for executing judgment. So here we are, with a key river running dry and mysterious eastern kings on their way thrown into a whirlwind of unfolding events. The drying up of Euphrates is more than just ecological change. It signifies major shifts on spiritual and geopolitical fronts, according to the biblical context. Diving right into it, let's talk about what happens after the Euphrates River dries up, according to biblical prophecy. It's not a minor event, folks. Many interpret this as symbolic language, suggesting a way being made for armies to cross over for an epic battle. Some theorize that this drying up signifies an end-time war, potentially World War III. Others suggest it may be more metaphorical, pointing towards political or social changes in the nations surrounding the river. The Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation, brings our attention to a prophecy related to the Euphrates River. There's mention that this river, one of the longest and historically significant waterways in Western Asia, will dry up. This event is believed to pave the way for kings from the east to march towards what many interpret as a final battle. Some experts suggest that the drying up of the Euphrates represents the removal of barriers or obstacles. It might symbolize an unprecedented period of peace or unity among nations once divided by this geographic boundary. Others lean more literally into biblical prophecy, asserting it could signify actual geopolitical shifts in power dynamics. In essence, this prophecy suggests that after the Euphrates dries up, it leads to a significant showdown of forces. Yet, regardless of various interpretations swirling around what exactly will unfold post-Euphrates drying, believers often find solace in the ultimate message of hope and redemption encapsulated in apocalyptic scriptures.
it's clear that biblical prophecies have a significant place in faith-based discussions. The Bible, especially the book of Revelation, offers intriguing predictions about the end times. One such prophecy centers around the Euphrates River drying up. The Bible suggests this event will pave the way for leaders from across the globe to gather for a great battle known as Armageddon. It's a concept shrouded in mystery and subject to numerous interpretations over centuries. Are there any other reasons why the Euphrates River is drying up? There's been a lot of talk lately about the Euphrates River and how it's been slowly disappearing. Scientists and experts have been trying to figure out why this is happening, and they've come up with a few different theories. One possibility is that climate change has caused less rain and more evaporation in the area, which has made the river dry up. Another theory is that dams upstream have messed with the natural flow of the water, which has led to the river shrinking. On top of that, people have been using up too much water for farming and industry, which has further reduced the river's water levels. While we can't say for sure what's causing this, these ideas give us some valuable insights into the complex reasons behind the Euphrates River's disappearance. The vanishing act of the Euphrates River has had a profound impact on the environment and local communities. The loss of a vital water source has led to decreased agricultural productivity, affecting the livelihoods of farmers and communities that rely on the river for irrigation. The decline in water levels has also disrupted the region's delicate ecosystem, threatening the survival of plant and animal species that depend on the river for sustenance. Moreover, the disappearance of the Euphrates River has cultural and historical implications, as it erodes the connection between present-day communities and their ancient roots. The enigmatic disappearance of the Euphrates River continues to baffle scientists, researchers, and the general public. The intertwined factors of reduced rainfall, dam construction, and human activities have contributed to the drying up of the river. At the same time, the emergence of mysterious caves adds another layer of intrigue to the mystery. The ongoing exploration and excavation of these caves, coupled with scientific research and analysis, hold the promise of unraveling the secrets behind the vanishing act of the Euphrates River. As we strive to understand the causes and implications of this disappearance, we must prioritize preserving and sustaining our natural resources for the benefit of future generations. So what do you think about this terrifying event? What is the right reason for it? Let us know your opinion about this. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And well, that's all about what we want to share with you in today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe. Your support will be our motivation in the future. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell to update the latest videos from our channel. Hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye and God bless you.